little closer, don't hide in the shadows, and nothing can count it with the children of the Lord. Move up a little closer, don't wait any longer, move up a little closer to the kingdom of the Lord. support to Mark's Mississippi Church, the Kumas in Brazil. God bless you. Thank you so much for what you do for the kingdom of God. Sister Beverly Robinson, God bless you. Thank you for what you do. God knows the sacrifice that people make. Sister Sippy, Sister Cindy, God bless you. God takes what you give. And he multiplies and blesses it. And the kingdom of heaven goes forth. Hallelujah. Thank God for people that sacrifice and people that give.
Acts 27 verse 14, one verse of scripture. But not long after there rose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurachlanon. Eurachlanon. They set out on their journey. And all of a sudden, there rose a storm. A great wind called Eurachlanon. We'll speak just a little bit more about Eurachlanon a little bit later in this message. Amen. But let's pray and believe God this morning. Blessed Jesus, we pray and ask, dear God, that you would have your way in this service, Lord, that you would touch souls, that you would anoint hearts to feel, ears to hear, eyes to see the things of the Lord as they take place before us. Dear God, we pray and ask this morning that you would move in a mighty way. God, minister to hearts, minister to needs, Lord. We're believing you this morning that you're going to do a work in the lives of your people. We'll stand in your presence to give you praise, to give you honor, to give you glory for all that you do and accomplish. In that wonderful name above every name, everybody said in the name of Jesus. Put your hands together for the Lord. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I think sometimes people come to the Lord and they have a misconception that when you begin your journey with the Lord that nothing will ever bother you. Nothing will ever shake you. Nothing will ever trouble you. But everything will just somehow pass you right on by. Or if things keep bothering you, then you might as well just give up. Something must be wrong with my experience with God. Something must be wrong with me or I wouldn't be having all of these troubles come upon me. A misconception. I'm going to talk a little bit about storms this morning. Storms. First you have clouds that begin to gather. Winds that will begin to blow. Thunder begins to roll. Lightning begins to flash. And all of a sudden rain begins to fall. And then you're in the midst of a powerful storm. I want to preach for a little while this morning on this thought. Then cometh the storm. Then cometh the storm. At one point or another during a storm, some people will decide to, to just give up and to succumb to the devastating effect that it can have upon their lives and those that are around them. There is a website that, that tells about different types of storms. It, it has a list of all the types of storms that can come upon us. Amen. But with these storms, it also has a list of things and uh, that you can do to prepare for the storms. Things that you can do to prepare for the devastation that may come in the wake of a storm. Amen. But there are certain types of storms that are much more difficult to prepare for. Such as a fire storm. And there can be an asteroid storm or or even the scientists are talking about here lately, not only the asteroid storms, but solar storms as well. These are types of storms that you have to live in a state of readiness. Because some storms you just can't start preparing for. You have to be ready for them. Amen. As I said several weeks ago, the Lord spoke to me, just be ready. You've got to be ready. Can somebody say, we've got to be ready. Amen. There's the type of people they've always puzzled me. And I, I've looked upon these people and I, I've admired them. But for the life of me, I just can't figure them out. <laughs> Why they would want to do such things. Or take up such an occupation as this. They're called storm chasers. Anybody ever heard of them? 
Why in the world would somebody want to chase a storm around, a twister, and it's slinging houses and uprooting trees and, and throwing semi uh, trucks and trailers across the road? Why in the world would people want to chase such storms as these? I don't understand these, these type of people, really, why they would want... I, they photograph them, they video them, they study them, they do everything that they know to do. Chasing storms. But I've come to realize there are also spiritual storm chasers. I do my dead level best to avoid storms. I don't like to be in the midst of a storm. I don't like anything about storms. I don't like Tornadoes, I've seen one when I was a child. It was a very frightening thing to behold. I, I, I've seen videos of them. I've seen pictures of them. Uh, they, they're, they're just not anything that I want to be a part of. Not at all. Uh, they're, they're very troublesome to me when I look upon storms of these types. But there are people that are spiritual ch storm chasers. Everywhere they go, they're looking for a storm. To arise. Something to take place. Something to happen. Amen. You see, you should be able to avoid storms. You should never want to take part in a storm. There is nothing that you can do when the lightning flashes to stop it from touching the earth. It's going to find its point somewhere. It'll strike a tree and rip it in half. It'll strike a house and set it afire. It'll strike a forest and all of a sudden there's a great blaze as a result of it. There's not much you can do about a storm. Amen. But take cover and do the best that you can to prepare for it. But storm chasers, amen, spiritual storm chasers, I don't understand why they want to chase trouble, why they want to chase all of the situations that can occur from a spiritual storm. When they get involved in these storms with them, amen, they also take others and pull others in the midst of these spiritual storms. I don't want to, anything to do with a spiritual storm. Can somebody say amen? I want to avoid every spiritual storm that I can avoid. I want to make sure that I have prepared, I have made myself ready, and when I see something coming down the pipe, I want to do my dead level bed to avoid the effects of it. Amen. I don't want anything to do with it. Amen. Chasing storms. Spiritual storm chasers. Storms that create chaos in people's lives. Sometimes they place themselves in the midst of these storms and sometimes they just get caught up in them as a result of a storm in somebody else's life. Sometimes we don't have a choice in the matter. Maybe one of our children are going through it, our spouse, one of our loved ones, they're going through a storm. They're going through one of the most heated trials of their life and all of a sudden we find ourselves caught up in the midst of it. Not by choice, but by association. We're that closely associated with some people and we're caught up in their storm. Storms will come, but how in the world can we ever prepare for them? There's a story told by Brother Larry Booker and I'd like to relate to the storm. California, where he lives, is, is noted for a lot of fires and that take place and devastate a lot of forest land. And there was one such fire that took place several years ago. And he had a friend that lived up on top of the mountain. And, and he knew he had to get to this friend because he knew that the fire was going to devastate his home place. And as a result, his friend would be burned alive if he couldn't get to him and, and, and let him know that this fire was on the way and get him out of there. So he drove and he drove and finally he came to a roadblock. The police were there. They were stopping people from going through. Oh no, you can't go through here. 
there's, there's the fires devastating the forest. There's a lot of problems. Uh, we can't let anybody through. We've got to stop all traffic right here. But he talked to them and he persuaded them that there's a friend on that mountainside. And if I don't get to him, this fire will kill him. I've got to get through. So finally he persuaded the police officer to allow him to pass on by. He kind of just looked the other way. He got back in his car and drove on. And away he went. He pulled up in front of the man's house and he got out and he knocked on the door and he said, hey, let me tell you, there's a fire headed this way and you've got to get out of here before it destroys not only your place, but you with it. You've got to co come on with me. Let's get out of here. We've got to go. The man just smiled pleasantly and looked at him and said, let me show you something. They walked out back and they showed him what looked like an old, worn out, broken down road grader. He said, you see, years ago, I realized that one of these days, on, there was going to be a fire that was going to take place. Come on, and it was going to burn this whole mountain off. He said, so years ago, I decided to prepare for it. He said, come on, let me show you what I've done. They walked out back and he showed Brother Booker a place where he had taken this road grader and, and he had graded out a fire break all the way around his property on the far perimeter of it. Several feet wide, there was no trees growing there and every once in a while he would take the road grader and grade it over again, nothing but dirt there. Long story short, everything was burned to a cinder but it stopped at the perimeter of his place. He said, you see, I prepared for this 30 years ago. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, there are storms that are going to come our way, but we're going to have to prepare for them. How do you prepare for them? You spend your time in prayer. How do you prepare for them? You spend your time in the presence of the master. How do you prepare for them? You make full well, amen, that you're not going to succumb to anything that comes your way. No matter what comes, no matter what the enemy throws at you, no matter what type of storm that it is, I made up my mind that I've made my peace with God. I'm going to stand on the word of God. Hallelujah. I shall not be moved. Why? Because I've got my feet on a rock. Hallelujah. My mind is made up. My heart is settled. Nothing's going to move me. Hallelujah. Why, Brother Napper, how can you stand like that? Oh, it's been almost 30 years ago, my friend. Hallelujah. I've come to the Lord God Almighty. And right then and there, I settled in my heart and my mind. Then nothing was going to turn me away from this. Nothing was going to turn me back. Hallelujah. I made up my mind. I'm going to live for God in the midst of adversity. I'm going to live for God no matter what the enemy throws before me. You've got to have a made up mind. You've got to settle it in your heart. No matter what hell belches out, you're going to stand for God. You're going to live for the Lord. Storm chasers. I've got a note for you. Amen. The Bible tells us about many types of storms that the Lord will send your way. Amen. If all you ever like is chaos and trouble and problems in your life, don't worry about it. Hallelujah. The Lord is here to help create all the trouble that you want. Job 21, 18. They are as stubble before the wind and as chaff Oh, that the storm carrieth away. Job 27, 21. The east wind carrieth him away. And he departeth. And as a storm hurleth him out of his place. Psalms 83, 15. So persecute them with thy tempters. Who tempteth it? It's the Lord God Almighty. And make them afraid with thy storm. Hallelujah. Isaiah 28, 2. Behold. The Lord hath 
a mighty and strong one, which as a tempest of hell and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. Hallelujah. Isaiah 29 and 6. Thou shall be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and with great noise, with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire. Listen to it. My God has a storm that nobody can withstand. If you want to live in a state of hell and chaos and confusion, you better watch out. You may create a little bit of trouble for self, but there's a whole lot more going to come your way than you won't be able to do anything about that no man can withstand. Come on, I said, no man can withstand the trouble that comes from the presence of the Lord. No man. Nahum 1 and 3, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. You see, I, I, I prayed to a place one time where death didn't really scare me at all. I, I could have cared less where I stayed and went on. To live is Christ, to be anointed. Oh, but to die is gain. Whew, that's to be rejoicing around the throne of God. Can somebody say amen? Amen. That was weak. <laughs> Everybody wants to go, but nobody wants to take the next train out, Brother Toby. <laughs> Hallelujah. Woo! Praise God. <laughs> Acts 27 and 14, once again, but not long after, there arose against an attemptuous wind called Eurachlodon. <clears throat> Have you ever thought what Eurachlodon really means? It means a northern wind. That's what it means. A northern wind. It's a name for a northern wind. Now, when I thought about the northern wind, I'll take a south wind anytime. Yes, That's sir. warm. <laughs> yeah. You can lay back on the hammock and take a nap and take it easy. But a northern wind brings with it coldness, a fear that all will be lost. It's during these cold storms that you can no longer feel the warming presence that comes from the nearness of the Lord. It's during these storms when you're feeling the blast of the coldness that the enemy comes and begins to tell you that it, you might as well just give up. It's during these storms that you begin to lose hope and the enemy of your mind tells you that you might as well just quit. What's the use of trying anymore anyway? It's during these storms because of the coldness of the northern winds, amen, that begin to try, amen, oh, that to warm yourself by some other resource, by some other source of heat, amen. I can't feel the nearness of the Lord. I can't feel that, that warmth and that closeness. I can't feel that security anymore. That security blanket seemingly is gone. I'm going to have to find something else. I'm going to have to draw something else in that I can feel comfort and security in. So what happens when there's a void in your life? All of a sudden it begins to create a vacuum. And a vacuum, when you pop the top off of something that has a vacuum in it, anything that's close to it, it'll suck it right in. When I was a kid, I used to take the vacuum cleaner. We had one of them old kind of vacuum cleaners, a little round thing with a hose on the end with a little thing you just run around. It wouldn't hardly pick up anything. Man, I used to love to pop that hose off the end of that thing and play with it. I had kitty cats. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you seen that done too, haven't you? I catch that kitty cat tail. That's right. A vacuum will suck in anything that it gets close to. All of a sudden, you get a little close to one of your toys, and boop! It's gone. Wow! Turn it off. It sucks up everything. My mama would tell me, boy, you don't need to treat that cat like that. Mama, I was just cleaning a little bit. <laughs> I was vacuuming. 
to lose hair off of it. But the absence of the Lord creates a vacuum in your, your life that will suck in anything of the world. It will begin to draw in things that are so undesirable in your life. And one day you'll stand in the mirror and the person looking back at you, you won't be pleased with anymore. You'll begin to wonder how in the world did I allow myself to get in this shape that I'm in. Come on, come on, it's during these storms that the enemy tries to snatch out of your heart the word of God that enables your soul to be saved. It's the word of God. It's during these storms that you begin to forget about scriptures like Luke 21, 36. Which says, watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Luke 18 and 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not faint. Can somebody say amen? amen. amen. And also, think about Jude 121. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, Praying in the Holy Ghost? How plain can that get? <laughs> what does the phenomenal world think about that scripture? How do they try to explain that one away? How in the world are you going to pray in the Holy Ghost lest you have the Holy Ghost? Amen. How in the world are you going to pray with the Spirit lest you have the Spirit? It's at these times when the storm comes, you fall on your face and you begin to cry out to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Oh dear God, touch me one more time, Lord. I feel all the hell is a cell against me and I have need of the presence of the Lord. I need your warmth. I need your touch. I need your presence. Dear God Almighty, touch me one more time. At those times you begin to cry Samson's prayer. Oh, just one more time. Remember me, oh Lord, and strengthen me. <laughs> How many of you feel that you've went through a storm? How many of you feel that you've been going through a storm? Several. Sudden storms. Sometimes they have very little warning. Sometimes none at all. And there's a storm. I remember several years ago, a friend of mine and I, we were out on a lake in a boat. And we just had a, a paddle. It's a John boat, but we didn't have a paddle. Couldn't put a motor in there. Didn't have a trolling motor at the time. So we had paddled to the other side of the lake. And we was going to catch us a boatload of fish. Uh -huh. One of those days they wouldn't bite. But all of a sudden, I mean all of a sudden, we were kind of in a in a hole. Trees all around us. You really couldn't see anything. It seemed like all of a sudden the winds began to blow. And you looked up and you could see the black clouds moving overhead. Oh, and they began to roll. All of a sudden, there were waves about so high. We thought surely we was going to be capsized in that little boat before we could make it back to the shore on the other side. Oh, we was paddling. We was almost like one of those cartoons that you could almost hear that paddle. Oh, come on, come on. <laughs> we were trying to get out of that. Sudden storms. They come out of nowhere at times. And they begin to devastate. They begin to devastate. You see, the enemy would have you to think that there are storms that's going to take your life that are going to destroy you. <clears throat> Some people seemingly have more storms arise in their life than others. I understand that. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not dumb to that fact at all. Uh, it seems like every turn that some people make that there's something else confronting them. Something else that's beyond all understanding. All I can tell you is this. God knows exactly what he's doing. He's not slack. As some men, men concerned slackness. But his long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. 
We've got to stay in the presence of the Lord no matter what we're called upon to go through. Well, Brother Napa preachers don't seem like they ever go through it. You want to walk in these leathers for a while? You want to walk where I've walked? I don't think there's anyone in here would want to walk the path of life that I've walked in this world. I can assure you. I can sit down and compare apples and oranges anytime you get ready. We'll sit there and sob over our sob stories and we'll weep and cry together. Well, the Bible says rejoice with them and rejoice and weep with them and weep. We can weep a while and then we can praise the Lord a while for what He delivered us out of. Praise God. And we're, we can be biblical. But here's where we stand. There are storms that arise and the enemy tries to convince you it's going to do you in. This is a storm that's going to take you and you won't weather it. It'll destroy you. Only if you succumb to that notion will the storm be able to overtake you. If you had not went through it yet, just hang on. We will all be confronted with storms. Amen. That's what makes us strong. Amen, brother. You see these trees that are planted on the mountainside. I grow these little bonsai trees at home. They're only so tall and they look like a full grown tree. They're kind of cute. Uh, I still got some alive. I've let some die over the last couple of years. Just busy myself and didn't tend to them as I should have. But they're cute little things. But but when you look at them, you realize that the root system doesn't go very deep because you have to trim the roots. The tap roots, the first thing that goes. And then the little fine roots are the support roots. And you have to trim them once a year. That keeps it in its miniature state. You see, every time you go through a storm and those, that tree of yours just begins to rock and reel in the wind, before those roots ever had time to grow to maturity, then it begins to break those little hairline roots away. And they have to start all over again. And it keeps you stunted into a, a place of where you're this, your faith to stay small. Amen. You've got to learn to put your roots down deep. Those trees that are on the mountainside, they may stand a hundred foot tall, Brother Jody. And you may see them sway in the wind this way and back that way. And you say, oh, that's a big, mighty tree. From all appearance it is, but that's not where it gains its strength at. It's the root system that goes deep down in that mountainside. Deep, deep down. It's the part that you never see. Preacher, if you go through it, how do you stand? If this one goes through it and that one goes through it, how do they stand? And everybody else seems to this fall by the wayside. All you're seeing is our outward appearance. That's all. You don't see a root system. It goes down deep. Hallelujah. It goes deep. 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 I've prepared for this a long time. Then cometh the storm. Then cometh the storm. There's a story told about a fortress by the name of Croxtis the Valley. It stands on the border of the Syrian desert. It took 150 years to build it. It was built back in the time of the Crusaders. It was a place for them to hold up to help would arrive. It was a place to hold off different ones that would come against them, the Muslims that would try to overtake them. It was built into a steep, steep hill. The road that led to his front gate was filled with sharp hairpin turns that would stop any type of catapult or battering ram that would be able to approach it. It was not able to get it close enough to do any good at all. It had on the back side a, a wide ravine about 20 foot wide, some 80 foot deep, and it was filled with huge rocks. It made it impregnable. 
for anyone to try to tunnel through. It was impossible. It couldn't be done. They had, had food and water stored up that would last them for one year. By this time, no doubt, help would be able to find its way to them. There had been 12 different attempts by different ones that would try to, to destroy this fortress. And none has succeeded. Not a one. In 1271, the great Saladin, after many months with no success, he was about to give up. He tried and he tried and he tried. Months had passed. It is of no use. It's indestructible. They are impregnable. We can't get through to this fortress. We can't destroy the people on the inside. But then a little thought came to him. He got an idea. They took a carrier pigeon and the crusaders' own language. They pinned the words. They attached it to the pigeon and turned it loose. The pigeon flew around and landed on the wall of the fortress. They took the carrier pigeon and they read the note. You might as well surrender. No help. It's coming. You might as well surrender. No help. It's coming. Disheartened as they were, they came to the conclusion if no help is coming, we might as well surrender. They opened the gates and single file they began to walk out and they surrendered. They gave up. They gave up. <coughs> they weren't going to try anymore. No help's coming. You see, that's what the enemy tries to plant in your mind. Nobody cares about me. Nobody's concerned about me. I might as well just give up. I might as well just throw in the towel. Come on, brother. When they found the truth out, that it was just a ploy. It was just trickery from the enemy. They were so filled with shame that they didn't know what to do. Slaughtered done away with the fortress was destroyed one understand there's even parts of it that still stands to this very day it was so impregnable built so solid huge magnificent fortress you might as well give up no hymns coming no hymns coming no hymns coming <laughs> That's what the enemy of your soul wants you to believe. No help is coming. You might as well give up. You might as well just throw in the towel. In Mark chapter 4, there's a story that's told. They're all out on the boat and a great storm arose and the ship was now full of water and they thought surely we'll perish, we'll sink. But Jesus was on the back side of the ship, head on a pillow asleep. And they awakened him and said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Come on, brother. Oh, ye <coughs> of little bonsai faith. O oh, ye that has no root system. O oh, ye that has a prayerless life. O oh, ye that knoweth not the word of God. O oh, ye of little faith. And he stood and said, Peace, be still. The 
the wind ceased, the waves laid down, the sea became as glass. Peace. Be still. I don't care what you're going through, that my Lord and my God's not able to speak. Peace, be still to the storm. There's raging in your life. He's able to speak peace to any situation that may be trying to overtake you. Psalms 107, 29. He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Isaiah 4 and 6. And there shall be a tabernacle for, the, for a shadow in the daytime from the heat. And for a place of refuge. And for a cover from the storm and from rain. Isaiah 25 and 4. And thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. There is no situation that comes upon you that God is not able to take control of. Don't allow the enemy to destroy you. Amen. Don't allow the enemy to overtake you. <coughs> Brother Smith was a, a champion boxer. I used to love to listen to the stories that he told about his going through college and boxing and different things. Pictures he had that he, he liked so much about his younger years and him boxing. Well, no doubt he is quick and sharp with that left, too. Matter of fact, we first came down, probably the first or second week we was here, I, I made a, a news article. I still have it on my iPad, a news article. He's standing on the car with his right hand propped on the top. And it was during the baby dedication. Christian, Brother Randy, and I, I said, don't let that right fool you. It's the left you got to watch out for. Come on, hallelujah. The alias Harold Smith was last seen at Mark's first union at Pentecostal church doing a baby dedication, fighting devils. <laughs> but there's a story told about Cassius Clay. How many of you remember him? The name Cassius Clay. His trainer was at the ringside. His opponent was before him and his opponent's trainer was at the other corner of the ring and he was taking a terrible beating. He'd go back to his trainer and he'd say, man, you got to throw in the towel. Just throw it in. He said, he's beat me to death. I'm not going to survive and I'm not going to make it. Get back out there. You've got to go one more time. Just get back out in the ring. Keep fighting. This process would repeat several times. He'd go back to the trainer. After fighting and being pulverized over and over again. And he was shouting to him, throw in the towel. Don't you see? He's beating me to death. I can't take it anymore. I've had all I can stand. Throw in the towel. Get back out of the ring and fight. Once again, he stumbled back out. To center ring and he began to fight once again and everything was dazed and everything was growing blurry and all of a sudden he seen a tile float down from the air and he thought oh thank goodness he threw in the tile thank goodness but all of a sudden the announcement was made It was his opponent. His towel was not his. Cash.
ashes clay went on to become the great Muhammad Ali. One of the greatest, greatest fighting champions the world has ever known. One of the greatest boxing champions. But every time he turned around, just throw in the towel. I can't take it. I've got to give up. I've got to quit. I can't take it. I can't stand it anymore. He beat me to death. You see, that's the way the devil wants you to feel. He wants you to feel like you can't take it anymore. You can't stand it anymore. He pulverized you until you don't want to be battered anymore. And you want to just throw in the towel. You just want to throw your hands up and give up. Not even try anymore. But there's somebody on the ringside, Brother Joey. There's always somebody on the ringside. You can do it one more time. Come on, take your stand and make your fight. Come on, one more time. Take your stand. You're not going to throw in the towel. You're going to keep fighting. You can make it. You can make it. No, come on, one more time. You can make it. You don't have to stop. You got a Sunday school teacher. You got people on every corner. They're shouting to your victory. You can make it. Don't give up. Come on. Stand your ground. Look the enemy. I ball the high ball. Then tell him I'm going to make it. Come on. I want you to walk out of where you're at right now. Make your way down the front of this church. Come on, everybody. I want you to come for just a moment. Just a moment. Come on, this makes it easy for those that are around you. I want you to come. You need a touch of God in your life. Seems like Raise your hands to Jesus. Come on, that's faith. It says, God, I have need of you, Lord. God, I need you. I tried it on my own for 29 years. And I made a wreck and a mess of my life for 29 years. Yeah. 